All right, we're back. We grew a little bit, some people dropping in for the teaching. That's great. Um, that was uh, the Neville brothers, Aaron Neville and his brothers uh, singing the change is going to come. And uh, that's what we're here for. I think that's really underneath why everybody shows up is because, um, well, uh, job number one uh, is uh, transformation. Becoming, as Merton said, uh, what we have to be is what we are. And uh, uh, somebody who was facing the second half of life, retired from their job, no real financial worries uh, was sort of freaked out because they said, well, what am I going to do now? You know, it, it, it was retired. And, and I said, uh, transformation, it's the big game. It's a big game. It's what we're in it for, to become who we're meant to be, who we're, it's, it's, it's loaded in. This is the big, this is, this is a Camino. This is, this is the pilgrimage to become who we are, and that's transformation. And um, I think, anyway, that's why I'm here. And being with this group transforms me every time. And uh, so we're going to go into it a little bit today by looking at uh, what really transforms human beings. At least it's the, what they call the Sophia Perennis in Latin, the perennial wisdom traditions. They all say the same thing. It's um, a mystery. Uh, you could call it God, you could call it the Tao, you could call it Allah. You know, we, we call well, a lot of lame, a lot of names. Uh, there's something bigger than all of this that we're in contact with. And when we're in contact with it, it transforms us. Uh, when we're consciously in contact with it, it really transforms us, it speeds up. We're always in contact with it. You can't be out of contact with you know, reality. We're in it, we are it. But when you're conscious of it, uh, when your intention is to be conscious of it, 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 it puts transformation in high gear, however that works out. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna read this. Uh, uh, a poem that's sort of wrapped around this. It's words wrapped around this. Uh, and then uh, we'll, I'll flip the mandala back up there. But even while I was uh, in the break time, the poem kept moving around on the page for me. It kept clarifying, it kept getting truer. So it, uh, if you have the poem, it'll be a little bit uh, different version, but essentially the same. The mandala is uh, the same. Uh, the five mysteries are the same. Well, this is what I call the mandala of great mystery. And then we'll, we'll double back and break down, break it open, you know, break it open. There'll still be plenty of mystery left, but we'll actually have a little bit of more of a, a deeper relationship to these five mysteries. Uh, start out with this line. How you see is what you see. If you got nothing else out of uh, today's uh, work, if you could, you could carry out those seven words, how you see is what you see, explains a lot about how people can uh, see reality in a totally different way than you do. We see it all the time. How you see is what you see. And the way that I see ultimate reality and the way that I see just this, the two words I used to point to it, like a finger pointing to the moon, are great mystery. Well, are you talking about the ultimate reality or just this, just this pain in the ass, just this illness, just this um, emotional outburst, just this um, question that there is no answer to, just this um, toilet backed up. <laughs> Really, it could be so what they call the scandal of the particular, you know, the ultimate reality, and just this. Um, they're both great mystery. Say, so, how does great mystery manifest to us as opposed to, you know, the bushes outside my window or the 
cardinal uh, up there on the, you know, just blazing red? How does the great mystery uh, manifest to human beings? Well, it depends on the eyes that you're seeing it. it. Depends on the eyes that are seeing it. Remember, don't forget this. How you see is what you see. If you're looking with the eyes of a child, you might see a family of unpredictable gods. Certainly, that's how we all saw with those first eyes of the with the childhood operating system. All these huge beings. Maybe it was just two. Maybe it was just mom and dad, or maybe you had older brothers and sisters. I know some of you have were born into families with four or five older siblings. Well, first you know these unpredictable gods as we saw them. You know, then you, you're you're right with the Greeks on Mount, on Mount Olympus. If you, if you go into Greek mythology, that's a certain way of seeing childhood operating system, you see. For our first take on the universe is, what the hell is this? What is this? Well, all these unpredictable huge beings here, you know, overwhelming. And you couldn't predict them. And so you start to get a, a you start to notice this one who was your mother. Hopefully she was there. And then you say, well, she'll feed me. And so we, we start working with that basic operating system what we see we, we which makes all these things uh, gods and unfortunately they're unpredictable and sometimes they can be uh, not that loving who knows maybe you know who knows it, it's it's a mystery that's the first thing uh if you look through the eyes of reason later you know they you know catholic schools and whatever and catholic theology they say well you when you're at the age of seven, that's the age of reason. Well, I'm not so sure. Look at the politicians we have now. I'm not sure uh, a lot of them have hit the age of reason yet, but there you go. But that that's another kind of operating. So it's another, you know, how you see it. It's a different thing. And, and if you look through the eyes of reason, you might see the world, you probably see the world as divided with endless problems to be solved. And you know, Everybody says, oh, America's divided, oh, Russia and Ukraine or whatever. Well, it, de it depends on the eyes you're looking at. And so that's probably, for most of us, the dominant the operating system. How you see is what you see. And if you're seeing through the eye, uh, the, the eyes of reason, it'll just be one problem after another. Okay, that's just nature of the, it's the nature of the glasses that you're looking through. It sees problems, it sees differences. I see the cardinal right outside the window. You know, it's you know different than what Ron looks like. We see differences, and that's the nature of that operating system, and it has some value. Okay, but if you look at great mystery, the same great mystery, it's all the same. If you look at the, the at great mystery with the eye of the heart. You could see five human mysteries arrayed in a quite an, a, an exquisite mandala. They're right there, glowing at you, just like the mandala and the zendo here. Uh, and I'm going to put up, I'm going to screen share what you could see with the eyes of uh, contemplation, really the eyes, the eye of the heart. And so we're, we're going to work with this here now. This is what a contemplative person does. It, it sees the, these five great mysteries, the mystery of just this, the mystery of intimacy. Uh, in the previous uh, version, the, the version of the poem that I put out on a Monday, I had uh, 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 life, uh, life as it is up at the very top. And uh, in that, truly is what just this is. It's life uh, as it is, but uh, 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 that term made it a little clearer for me. So I'll, I'll open that one up. And then in the, the, as you go around the mandala, as you go to the, from the top to the right, I had love, which certainly is a great mystery, but um, love's a lot. I could have put God on the top. Well, automatically you're in the Sistine Chapel and find out what you don't like about this or that. So, so just this is better there. And, and for love, love's the same way. Love is a Subaru. Well, I don't think so. Even though I like Subarus and I'm driving one, 
but uh, you know, we've, we've, we've ruined the word God and we've ruined the word love. So I, I, you know, hopefully this word will last for a while as a finger pointing to this mystery. Intimacy, I think is a clearer word where we'll unpack what that really is. Um, and then at the bottom of the mandala, suffering, great mystery, great mystery. One of my, uh, one of my uh, fellow pilgrims I've been walking with for some years, she has chronic fatigue syndrome. Great, great mystery. Illness, illness comes in, uh, you know, illness is one of the great the sufferings that human beings encounter. Uh, but there are mysteries, like it's, especially if you have something like chronic fatigue syndrome, because nobody really knows what it is. And uh, one of the hard things is, you know, people think you're imagining or that anybody who has anything like this or undiagnosed uh, illnesses or that you can't put your finger on, it's a great mystery. It's, so cancer was diagnosed, still a great mystery. And then finally, and then death. And somewhere between suffering and death, you can put aging, you can put illness, you know, these are facets of these particular, you know, just as you get a little older and you're, you know, we're all immortal till we're somewhere in our twenties or thirties, unless you get a serious illness early on, we all don't think about death. And we certainly don't think about what's in the center of all this, the center of the mandala is eternity itself, which um, we'll get to. <laughs> it's easy to get to eternity because we're in it, okay? But uh, so we're gonna work, we're gonna open up this mandala a little bit. Um, the rest of the poem is says, heart vision will enable you, you know, be able to see the world in this term, will enable you to align your living, align your living experience with great mystery. The heart, the eye of the heart, and the heart operating system, what's known as the heart, uh, the sacred heart, the Bodhicitta in Buddhism, the sacred heart in Catholicism, what's, what, what's known as the heart, that kind of vision is not about this kind of binary vision, seeing opposites and, and differences. That's all, that's all fine, it's useful, but uh, the heart, uh, that's why I say the eye of the heart, the eye sees everything as one. It sees everything as connected, see? And you can align the way you live with that vision. Alignment is, is, is what it, it gives you. It's more like a compass where binary vision of reason is more like a, a, a tape measure. They're two different instruments. But finally to align your life with ultimate reality is where you find peace. And mostly we're at odds with the way things are. We're at our odds with just this. Uh, and great, this great mystery we're trying to align with, it, it's not random. It's not rational. It's not pre-rational either. It's transrational, which means it's rational plus. It's greater than, it's greater than reason. And so we need an operating system that goes beyond reason to align with it. Uh, contemplative practice will give you uh, the wholeheartedness that you need. And again, that word wholehearted, it's a bit of, it's like from the department of redundancy department in one sense, you know, because uh, the heart is whole, it sees things as whole, but that idea of that, you know, wholehearted response, you know, wholeheartedness is a, a contemplative state. It might be what the, the Buddhists call enlightenment be able to live with your whole heart, to be, have your whole heart open to ultimate reality. Uh, and if you, can, if you can get into this state of wholeheartedness, you can live this great mystery. You can live this whole thing, all the, the five aspects with grace, grit, and passionate equanimity. And we'll break open those terms uh, at the very end. But I want to double back now to, to our mandala. Top of the mandala, call it uh, absolute reality. Whatever you think ultimate reality is, whatever word you want to throw at it, God or Allah or 
the cosmos, emptiness, the Buddhists will use, shunyata, you know, there, there's all these words we throw at it, but the, the reality is ultimate reality, the really real. Um, I like the term just this. The Zen guys like that term too. Uh, in one of the, the Zen guys would keep the, the last words of the, the master before he graduated into the next realm. And one of the great Chinese, uh, oh no, he was a Japanese Zen master. Uh, he was there on his deathbed and his last words were, uh, he was smiling, he just said, just this, just this. Uh, one of the, the Chinese Zen koans, what is the Buddha? And they said, uh, the answer from the master was the oak tree in the garden. One of the great answers from another Zen master, he just said, uh, shit out a stick, just this, whatever, you know, not whatever in terms of I don't give a shit, but just, it's this, just this, just this moment. If you're looking for ultimate reality uh, in a few moments, which we normally are, or if you're, you're, you're looking backwards into the past to try to see ultimate reality, neither one of those work. Just this moment. Just this voice you're hearing. Just what you're seeing on the screen. Just what you're seeing beyond the screen. Cardinal jumps in and out of my peripheral vision. He's looking for food on the ground. Big fat red cardinal. Just this. You could say that. That would be the Zen answer to anything. Because they don't get the good thing. Um, I spent my first 15 years with the Zen guys, Suzuki Roshi, especially. And he didn't talk about beliefs. And as a matter of fact, he totally blew my mind when I was reading Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I have a few people reading that book now. He just says, it's absolutely critical that you believe in nothing. Well, that blew my mind growing up a Catholic. Hell, memorizing the Baltimore Catechism or what you should believe. And well, and they said, no, you must believe in absolutely nothing. Drop your belief, open your eyes, wake up. To just this you can you can spend your whole life believing something then when you're you're uh, gripping the sheets at the end of life all of that's gone and it's you it's just this just this person at the bedside just this breath see so just this it's what in christianity uh, uh the franciscans and especially a guy named uh, dun scotus who was somehow a Scotsman who made it into to, to made it to Paris and where the where the monastery was he was in. Dun Scotus called it the scandal of particularity. So what is ultimate reality? Shit on a stick. Sistine Chapel. These words hitting your eardrum right now. Say, so that's a great mystery. How could that be? Well, it is a bit of a mystery, but it's what all these mystics point to. You say, what great mystery? Pay attention. Simone Weil, the great uh, Jewish slash Christian, incredible mystic, uh, World War II mystic, uh, in French mystic. She said, uh, prayer is attention. Slow down and pay attention to just this. Now it's the talk. Are you, are you halfway listening to the talk and halfway thinking, gee, I should have done something else? Well, we all do that kind of thing. Just this, that's the first mystery. That's a great mystery. You could say, just God. You know, if that word means ultimate reality to you, but not something you can put a box around, it's not something you can really capture in three letters or as many letters as you want. Just this. Now, uh, intimacy. Intimacy, uh, I think it's a better word than love because it's the basis of real love. A lot of people think when they think intimacy, they think of sex or something. Well, sex can be very intimate, but uh, not always is, and maybe rarely is for a lot of people. 
uh, intimacy is a conscious, uh, first of all, it's a conscious opening to just this. It's when you decide you're going to, you know, open your heart, open your entire being to whatever is present in this moment. That's the basis of intimacy. Our capacity for opening and for tenderness towards anything is our capacity for in intimacy. When I walk the road, uh, when I'm really walking the road as a spiritual practice, I just start by consciously opening my, all my senses and everything to the walk. And so you can be intimate with the call of a blue jay, you can be intimate with the gravel on the driveway, intimate with the oak trees and the tulip trees, intimate with the sky, intimate with just this, you see. And so the intimacy is connected there. And all these five are connected, by the way, you can't disconnect them, but intimacy is opening to, to just this moment, say. And we all have the capacity with a kind of tenderness, a little hard to be uh, open and tender and loving to, you know, your, your frozen shoulder or your hip that hurts. That, that's really hard and it's really hard and Jesus knew it. <laughs> that's why he's, this was a really advanced teaching when he says, uh, be open and intimate to your enemies. Love your enemies. It's the hardest teaching in the world. You know, love your limp. You know, love your, uh, the way your face looks in the morning when you, when you wake up to wash your face. <laughs> that's pretty rough, you know. Uh, love, this, love this aging body. And uh, it's uh, intimacy, interestingly enough, it's often experienced in moments of self-disclosure, which is another way of saying in moments of self-opening. Doesn't mean necessarily through words. It just really means when you, the, the artificial self, which is there to protect us, the egoic self is a kind of barrier to that. You know, it's a kind of shield and uh you know your persona who you are you know whatever but when you can actually go through that you can open that and you can just let people see you intimacy is intimately connected with the ability for self-disclosure and uh just letting people in and also letting yourself out then there's a meeting see intimacy is always about a meeting and intimacy is is it's the same as the soul. The soul is not a thing. The soul is when your uh, essence of your being meets the essence of some other being. And uh, there always has to be a meeting, see? And you have to open up for the meeting to happen. If there's no intimacy in your life, start at home. Uh, you know, and it was very courageous to open your heart. That's the meaning of the word courage, courage, cour, as Vivian knows, and anybody who knows French, cour means heart. Courage does not, to be, does not mean to be fearless. Courage means to have, the, to have the ability to open your heart, especially in painful situations, especially, in, especially in that. But to, to just live, you know, wholeheartedly, open-heartedly, you see. Oh, the interesting thing about intimacy, you know, if you really are intimate, if uh, you feel larger after an intimate encounter. And again, we, we got to think beyond this monomania we have about that intimacy means sex. Yeah, rarely, <laughs> unfortunately, probably rarely in most people's uh, no, yeah, you, you know you've had an intimate encounter with when after the encounter you feel larger. There's a sense of expansion. Again, that's what the soul wants. It wants you to grow into who you're meant to be. The soul wants the acorn to become the oak tree, you see. Where, you know, if you're into self-help and, and you know, you're all caught up in your ego, you can, you can be like the acorn polishing its, its shell forever. This is the nicest shell in the world. I'm the, I'm the most beautiful acorn in the world. Well, 
you haven't done what you're meant to be. Acorns are meant to be an oak tree. Stop polishing the shell and, well, what an acorn has to do, the most beautiful or the most ugly acorn, it doesn't matter. You have to go into the ground, into the dark, and the shell has to break open. That's the beginning of intimacy, you see. But that's also the beginning of suffering, you know, for the shell to break. So then that, that's intimately connects to the next thing. If you are courageous enough to open your heart to the, what is, you will feel pain. I mean, this uh, a picture above me. Uh, it sits behind me all the time. Uh, Jesus hanging on the cross. Uh, that was suffering. People get hurt. That's just what happens to people. Um, and especially if you live a life of wanting to be intimate with, 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 with what is, you want to be in, intimate with what is your life, if you're choosing the path of intimacy, not everybody is choosing that path and you get hurt because you know it's like uh, it's like lowering your guard. And then yeah, you will get. You will get a few jabs and hooks, and you will you will get you will get your you will get body blows when you open your guard. You can live like this, okay? My father was a fighter. My father was actually a you know an amateur fighter. He was he was outraged watching uh, Muhammad Ali box because Muhammad Ali was so good. He 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 fought with his arms down. My father couldn't understand that. You know, why would you let your guard down? Well, because you want to be intimate with this before it's all over. You want to know what some things are. And so you, th these things are connected. They're not disconnected parts on the wheel, see? So, but when you lower your guard, you will feel pain. Now, uh, that's just a human experience. Even if you have your guard up your whole life, life's going to get through. You're going to feel pain. You're going to feel the pain of separation, pain of non-intimacy, which is one of the deepest pain. Why not, you know? I'm not close to really very many people, but, but also people, you know, people will shoot through, life will shoot through, life from the inside, because our bodies are, you know, in the prototype to have, to have a body, to be a, an incarnated person. Uh, in a way, from the time you're born, you're dying. You know, the nature of a human being is to age and to get illness eventually, maybe one great illness, and eventually for the body to die. Okay. Uh, the Tibetans don't have a word uh, for uh, death like we do. Death is like Beethoven. Da, 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 da. In Tibetans, they have the, their word would translate as at some point, uh, these interesting human beings, these Buddhas to be, they will discorporate, they will unbody. That's just the nature of things. The the true. There's no dead. There's no dead persons. There's no dead people in Tibet. There are corpses. You know, they unbody. So they don't feel feel that anybody dies really the way we think of death. They feel like yeah, you do graduate. You do unbody, discorporate. You unbody, and you keep going on. And uh, don't worry about it. You know that they're big fans of eternity, which we're getting to because eternity shines through all of the four. It connects all of it because don't worry about it. Don't worry about the fact that, you know, you're 72 like me and you're still hung up. You're still, you know, not enjoying life that much. You're still worrying about shit, even though you got everything. And, you know, you, know, you go through a day and it's miserable. Don't worry about that because you got eternity. You're going to get there from the Tibetan point of view. The wheel goes round, and you're going to get another shot, and then another shot. Uh, and uh, but uh, but let's just work with suffering for a minute. What changes the thing is is that your willingness to be conscious. You know, unconscious suffering is what the Tibetans call misery. When you're when you you don't have a conscious stance about suffering. If you think, well, why am I suffering? And, oh, they did it to me. 
you know, ah, you know, you, you, that's a miserable life to live. You're blaming everybody else. You're blaming yourself. Even you're blaming God, ah, you know, and that's misery. That's unconscious suffering. Uh, Conscious suffering is what we saw with Jesus on the cross. That's the great emblem of it. Uh, that's what that means. Uh, he wasn't uh, uh, dying to atone for our sins. That's really bad theology. He was showing us uh, how you go through this inevitable thing called suffering. The Buddha has suffering in the first noble truth. These two guys, very different, coming from different points of view, different temperaments different cultures but they both put suffering right out there they said you gotta you've got to deal with this mystery of suffering and conscious suffering just as conscious intimacy or conscious love these are the two great drivers of transformation and so here's the here's the absolute gospel on conscious suffering if you want to put it in a few words uh, you either transform it or you transmit it. There's no other way out of this. When you get hurt, uh, uh, but your body gets hurt, your, your, your mental wounds, emotional wounds, spiritual wounds, sexual wounds, 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 wounds. Jesus talked about the five wounds. Well, the five wounds of Jesus are the, the mandala you're looking at. Uh, when you get wounded on any of those levels, you, here's your choice. You can transform it or 100% you will transmit it. Even if it's you're really a kind of repressed guy like me and you, it's not right to hurt people, well, you, you put it into your own self some way. Self-loathing, self-flagellation <laughs> in one form or another. Uh, but most you know, most people can't even contain that much. And so they'll, it'll spill out to other people sideways. So you either transform it or transmit it. And that's, again, that's why it's so crucial if you decide that whatever happens, it's my job to transform it, not to point the finger at anybody, not to blame anybody, although other people do hurt you because in a way they're unconscious. They don't know what to do with it. The great, uh, the great Quaker uh, wisdom figure, Parker Palmer, he said, violence, notice how much violence we have in our culture, incredible, in the world, 100,000 troops massing on the border of, you know, Ukraine and troops in, violence happens uh, when people don't know what to do with their pain. That's a great truth too, great truth of suffering, violence happens. You do violence to yourself. You do violence, you know. You know, most of the gun deaths in this in this culture happen actually in the home, and it's somebody you love happens to have a gun. I mean, he or she blows their gaskets, and boom, boom. You know, very dangerous to have a weapon in your house. I'm glad I didn't have one. Uh, Violence is what happens when you don't know what to do with your pain. So this, this whole training that we're going through is saying, okay, we have to have a way to transform our pain. And con the whole contemplative practice is about that. Uh, you, you know, the mind cannot, you know, somebody will say, I just can't wrap my mind about this. Well, no kidding. The mind is, this is, this is mystery. This would be, these are big time things. And the mind is, uh, can't do it. Now the heart can wrap its arms around anything. And that heart is a, a word we're using for this ultimate operating system, spiritual operating system. It's what can wrap, it's, that's why you have, to, you have to see this with the eyes of the heart. So you either transform it or you transmit it. Oh, I read a book about forgiveness by uh, Desmond Tutu, and he was behind, uh, he's graduated, another great teacher just graduated recently, but he, uh, he was the engine behind the whole forgiveness uh, reconciliation thing in South Africa. 
And he said, here's the point. When you get to the point where you're hurt, you, you can choose one or two paths. You can hurt somebody back, which is the normal thing, tit for tat. You can go on the road of hurt or you can go on the road of healing. The transforming it leads to your healing. And you can't expect the world to be healed if we have all these unhealed people in there. You know, many of them with people with a terrific amount of power. Okay, so you, you, it's always that fork in the road. You're gonna get hurt in this life. Suffering is uh, inevitable, pain is inevitable. Carl Jung said the root of all mental illness is the avoidance of the legitimate pain of being a human being. Now, whether that pain turns into misery or conscious suffering, you know you got a choice. And a lot of the spiritual way is learning how to open your heart and say, yeah, just this, okay, okay. It hurts, it hurts a lot. Am I gonna give that hurt back to the person I think is responsible or am I going to transform it? You know, this is about, so if, if you get intimacy and you get suffering, conscious, conscious love, conscious suffering, well then that's a huge engine to, for transformation. Now death, death, uh, it's, it's, you know, I've got a whole book won the Pulitzer, it's called The Denial of Death. I'm reading it slowly. <laughs> but, you know, we're, cultures, basically Western cultures are there to deny that death has ever come. You know, you can watch Netflix forever. You know, and then and you're still, you don't ever think that, hey, at some point, this body goes, then what? See, people don't, you know, people say, oh, that's it. You unplug the TV program over. Well, Wisdom traditions don't think so. And that's a pretty scary uh, concept if you think about it. Uh, the wisdom tradition says this, perennial uh, wisdom traditions, all of them, indigenous ones, Western, Eastern, they all say die before you die. Well, what the hell did that mean? Die before that. Jesus said that. You know, he confused the Pharisee who was talking to him in the middle of the night. He was sneaking around. He didn't want to be seen with this guy. And he said, you know, and he says, you, you, you must be, uh, you must die to be born again. Buddha is one of the Buddha's great uh, koans or mystery little sayings. He says, what's ready to die and what's ready to be born? He put, he doesn't say it the other way around. We're all interested in what's, what's new, what's coming. But he says, what's ready to die and what's ready to be born? So you, you need to die to the old stuff so the new stuff can have room to come in, you see. Uh, and so to die before you die doesn't mean to, you know, flagellate yourself. The, the Trappist at the monastery used to do that every Friday night. You know, my, my mentor from there told me about it. And uh, I said, will you still do it? And he said, oh, hell no. This was Father Gregory. He said, hell no. He said, I said, well, why did you stop? He says, well, I finally came to the conclusion that God was going to give me just enough suffering to become a state, and I didn't have to add one lash more. <laughs> yeah, so he really started to see the thing as it was. You don't have to add anything. You know, you don't need a hair shirt. Life is tough. Life is difficult. And uh, that's all right. Because we, we heal actually through our challenges. So life is challenging, difficult, painful. All right, so what are we talking about when we talk about die before we die? Well, you're dying to uh, the ego. You don't have to get rid of the ego. You don't have to kill the ego because the ego's got us all here at, on time. The, let's get what the ego is here. Uh, the ego is the maintenance man. The problem is when the maintenance man uh, the fantasizing that he's the CEO and he said, yeah, I can run your life. No, it's a maintenance man. The ego is not, nothing wrong with it. We love maintenance people. We, I love the people who pick up my garbage here on, you know, Friday mornings. Uh, but uh, it shouldn't be running your life. It's not the CEO. That's the dysfunctional ego. That's what Merton was calling the false self. What he said, the falsity is 
this thing, this voice in your head has convinced you that it knows how to deal with all this shit. It doesn't. It knows how to maintain time and space, how to maintain your body. If you can't survive, you can't thrive. You can't transform. So the ego is a maintenance man. Okay. The heart knows the truth. See? And when you start living the truth, you start to become realer and realer. You realize, okay, I don't have to get rid of the ego. There's a lot of stuff, especially in Asian uh, uh, Buddhism uh, uh, and Taoism about, well, not Taoism so much, but certainly Buddhism and other forms of, you had to slay the ego. It's what, what Paul talks about when he talks about the flesh is really, he's talking about this egoic uh, thing that really convinces you that, that it, it can run your life. Be worried, you know? Well, I was a, I'm a world-class worrier. I'm much better now, but you know, I tell you, well, reasonable people, responsible people worry about everything. <laughs> no, that's just a, one of the ploys of the ego. It's a distraction. You, you miss what's right in front of your nose because you're worrying about tomorrow. Jesus said, you know, look at the lilies of the field. Hey, they're not worried. You know, uh, they're not missing anything because they're thinking about tomorrow. Yeah. So the ego's fine uh, if, if it's the functional ego, because it's about functioning, you see, the functioning of the body. You got here at 7.30 in the morning or whatever time, you know. You know how to operate your uh, uh, computer to get here. That's all good ego stuff. That's functional ego. Dysfunctional ego is when it convinces you that uh, it knows, it knows. And you got to start to learn that what that voice, and you, you know, your, your ego is a little bit crazy too, because it, it really tries to convince you. And then if you believe it, then you're crazy, you see. So that's what you have to die to, to die to that voice in your head that's always, you, you get to learn that voice and you don't have to get rid of it. I mean, if, if, if you had a, a, a sibling who was uh, mentally ill, you'd know how to treat that person. You'd know how to, you know, that's the best they can do. You know, uh, you know, if they're hallucinating or whatever, you don't beat them for it. You don't try to get rid of them. You just, you know that, all right, I'm dealing with somebody who's, who, who's mentally ill here, say, or, you know, when your parents go into dementia, when you go into dementia, okay, you know, you can adjust, you don't expect them. So don't expect the ego to tell you how to handle these situations. They can tell you how to get from here to there. It can tell you how to keep, you know, your body in as good a shape as possible. They cannot tell you what to do with suffering, cannot tell you what to do with illness and the fact that we're graduating from this body, we're going to leave this body at some time. Well, that brings us to eternity. That's what, uh, that's what we're all in all the time. When the nuns, the Dominican nuns who, uh, God bless them, they taught me a lot of important things. But they said, you know, when you die, you either go to heaven or hell for all eternity. And, you know, and that was a really scary thought. And so we sort of shaped up, you know, I understand that whole thing, you know, can't go hurting people. God's keeping score, you know, and, you know, if you, you know, we total it up at the end. And if you got too many demerits, you go to your hell for uh, uh, a, a hell of a long time. <laughs> And then heaven was, heaven was scary to me too, because of course I wanted to go to heaven, but I said, gee, being in church forever? <laughs> I, I wasn't sure I wanted that, you know, because I didn't really, I was a little scared of this God that I grew up with. So I said, well, I don't know if I want to hang out with this guy forever, you know, but see, eternity isn't time at all. It's, it's, you're out of time. You're in just this, you're in just this moment. That's what, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh was famous for saying present moment, wonderful moment. Because it's, you know, that is eternity. Eternity is no time. It's not a hell of a long time. It's not a really long time. Uh, it's no time. You're out of time. You're beyond time. Okay, that's at the very center. That what links all this stuff. And so the beautiful beauty of that is, especially when you're older and start to discover this kind of stuff. I once had a woman break down into tears at a retreat, and I said, it was after the retreat, and I said, 
well, what's moving you, son? She says, oh, to discover this, you know, I'm six, you know, she was 62 at the time. And she says, I just, you know, I don't have that much time left. I said, are you kidding? You have, you have all eternity. You, you know, uh, the idea that you will come back and pick up where you left off uh, used to be in Christianity, it was in Christianity for about um, till uh, uh, the year 313 when we, when the, the, the followers of Jesus, the way of Jesus got, got in bed with the empire. And then, because uh, I mean, you know, Jesus was the guy who came back in a different form that not everybody recognized right away, but the teachings were there. They recognized them by the, the spiritual, uh, spiritual momentum, the spiritual force. They recognized his voice, his teachings. The body was different. So there were, it was, that was very common in early uh, uh, Christian fathers were writing about, you know, hey, take a breath here. You know, he came back world did the worst you could do it killed him and he came back you can't kill what we are see and then uh the empire didn't like that teaching because they wanted to control people a little bit more <laughs> they want to let them think they had a you know ultimate second chances so they said no no one one go around one rodeo that's it and if we turn the candle upside down and put it out you're screwed you were excommunicated you're going to hell forever that's pretty scary it's a pretty powerful way to run a you know, run a mafia business is what it was. You scare people and they'll do what you want. Jesus had nothing to do with that. He came back. And so the Tibetans, that's why the Tibetans have been very helpful to me because they said, you know, wherever you are, just keep putting one foot in, you know, keep working on this because, you know, where, where you'll pick up exactly where you left off. Okay. Which is why there's very little suicide in traditional Tibetan culture. Because that's, you know, that's a lot of steps backwards because you leave a big mess for people and cause people a lot of grief. So no matter how rough things were, they just kept, all right, we stuck with the practice, you see. So when you get to the last line of this poem, because we're, we're at our time, uh, contemplative practice will give you the whole heart of this you need to live this great mystery, to actually live this mandala, all the parts connected with grace, you got to realize that it, it's going to take um, help from everybody who's here today is helping everybody else, but also those people, Thich Nhat Hanh, Mert, the people living and dead. There's many, there's many beings that are not in this realm who are constantly at, in your corner. You got to understand what grace is. Grace is not something that picks and chooses. It's they constantly want you to, to transform and to be in their company and then help these other people. As the Dalai Lama says, you know, may I remain to dispel the misery of the world. It's the Bodhisattva prayer. Uh, so grace, grit is uh, means you, this is tough. You got to persevere, it's not easy. It's not like the fundamentalists say, you just say Jesus and everything is all right. Everything will be okay. Everything will be okay at some point. You know, you, we're all going to make it. The worst guy you can imagine is going to make it. But how, how much suffering he or she has to go through, how many lifetimes to get there, that's what we don't know. But if you're conscious during this lifetime, making the ultimate uh, transformative thing, it, 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 it speeds up the whole process. Well, why would you be in a hurry if it's all in eternity? And one Tibetan said, well, so you could help a lot of people who are suffering. You know, the, the more enlightened you get, the more, the, the more you can help other people in this lifetime, in the next lifetime. Dalai Lama's been around 14 times. He's coming back, you see. And then finally, passionate equanimity. So grace, grit, it's tough. You know, strap on, you know, you know, you, know, you get up, you put your, you, you do your practice every day so that you can, you can get to this last thing, which is passionate equanimity. Equanimity is not a big word in our culture. Equanimity, um, if, you, if you know the comics, uh, superheroes, the silver surfer would be a good example. Whatever the wave is, 
he's surfing it. And the bigger the wave, the more he likes it. Surfers go to the places where the big waves are. And actually spiritual uh, people who are working on the spiritual game, after a while you hit a tipping point and you wanna go to, to help the poor. You go in this, the early Christians were amazing in Rome. When Rome had the plagues, all the senators headed for the hills and the Christians who were mostly like slaves or just poor people, they went to help the people. Ro early Roman writers wrote about these Christians and they said, who are these people? Where do they get the courage to go and work with the people who are suffering from the plague? Well, these were, these were people who, you know, were transformed early on. This is before, you know, imperialized, you see. And that's equanimity. No matter what the situation is, you don't swing too much. Equanimity, you know, if you notice surfers, they're balanced. They're all, they got their hands up. They're people of balance. And passionate just means like you really have a passion for, for keeping your balance and for, for whatever the, the wave is, I'm surfing. I'm surfing. Even if the wave is serious illness, stage four cancer, my, one of my best friends, uh, another spiritual director, Mary Lucan, uh, she let go of her treatments because she was ratchet after him and they weren't going to give her much. And she just said, I'm going to be living with cancer. I'm through with dying with cancer. And so she was, she was there and she did. She lived through it. And it was, took a lot of grit, took a lot of grace, but she had reached that stage where she's, she was, she's flipped from dying with cancer to living with cancer. Well, live with the mystery. That's, that's the message. So anyway, something to chew on here. Uh, we'll be uh, back in about uh, uh, a quarter after, about 10 minutes. Okay, so take some time to reflect on this bathroom break and we'll be back uh, for uh, to sit a couple times at quarter after, 15 after. Thanks, uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening.